G'day, Starlo here. Welcome to the second and concluding part of my Soft Plastics 101 series. In the first part of this double header, I delved at considerable depth into the fascinating history of soft plastic lures, both internationally and here in Australia. In particular, I talked about what I refer to as the three waves of the soft plastic revolution in this country, and the small part that my mate Bushy and I were lucky enough to play in that all-important third wave, the one that finally established these lures locally in a major and permanent way. In this conclusion, Including instalment, I want to take a close look at the major styles of softies and how to fish with them, as well as the rigging paraphernalia for presenting those tails in an effort to help you crack the code and catch a lot more fish on these deadly lures. Let's get started by looking at the major categories of soft plastics. It's possible to divide most of the popular softies on the market today into a dozen or so broad families, although defining the boundaries between these categories is tricky at times. That's because one angler's soft stick bait is another's drop shot minnow, while the dividing line between a thin curly tailed grub and a small worm can be a bit blurry. But let's have a crack at categorising the 10 major major soft plastic types used in Australia today. The first of these are curly tail grubs, one of the largest and most popular families of plastics, and they've been around for decades. They typically have a fairly thick, often segmented or ribbed body, and a flat, tapered tail, usually in the shape of a question mark. Beyond these basics, there's a lot of variation. One thing that all good curly tails have in common is a strong built-in action. Pull these things through the water and that tail kicks, squirms and wriggles like something that's actually alive. This makes curly tails an especially good choice for less experienced anglers or those who simply want to chuck a lure out, crank it back and let it do its own thing. But grubs are also great tools in the hands of more experienced anglers. Curly tail grubs can be fished using a range of methods but they're especially effective when simply rigged on a jig head that's just heavy enough to suit the prevailing conditions. Conditions, then retrieved using a fairly slow lift drop or stop start action or even simply slow rolled with a static rod tip and a slow steady rotation of the reel's handles. The next family of plastics I want to look at are the T-tailed grubs and sliders. Charlie Brewer's slider was likely the first T-tailed grub and it spawned a legion of followers. A T-tailed grub, as the name implies, is a relatively short plastic worm or grub with a flat, circular, oval or triangular flap on the end of its tapered tail, usually oriented at right angles or thereabouts to the lure's body. In other words, the tail forms a little T-shaped piece at the rear of the plastic. When pulled through the water, this flap causes the end of the tail to wag back and forth. This action's typically quite subtle and mostly confined to the rear portion of the lure, yet sometimes it drives fish wild. While they work in many scenarios, tea tails are especially effective on deeply suspended fish, such as impoundment dwelling bass and yellow belly. There probably hasn't been a better lure made for dropping through these deep holding fish and slow rolling vertically or at an angle back up towards the surface. Interestingly, the same approach works well on brim and estuary perch holding deep in tidal estuaries, or on redfin and even trout in our inland lakes, dams and rivers. Just like curly tail grubs and tea tails, shads, fish and other soft swim baits are near foolproof soft lures. They have plenty of inbuilt action and start to swim the moment they're moved. So they'll catch at least some fish if they're simply chucked out and cranked back or trailed behind a boat moving at the right speed. Thanks to their pronounced built-in action, shads and fish are often the first soft plastics used by anglers, making the transition from hard-bodied metal, plastic and wooden lures to soft plastics. That's because you can fish these softies almost exactly like a hard lure and catch plenty of fish on them. Shads, fish and swim baits have a particularly strong appeal to all those predatory species that eat other fish. And this makes them especially popular in most saltwater applications. But they're also deadly in many fresh 
freshwater scenarios, especially where bait fish, particularly deeper bodied forage species like bony brim, make up a significant part of the food base. Along with curly tail grubs, tea tail grubs and the soft stick baits or flukes that I'll discuss next, shads, fish and swim baits represent a core soft plastic style for Australian fishing conditions. Okay, let's move on to those soft sticks, jerk baits and flukes. The first soft jerk bait or stick bait was most likely the Lunka City Sluggo. Like all good things, it was quickly copied and adapted. Subtle variations on this theme with little forked fish-like tails are often called flukes. Today, there's scores of soft plastic stick baits, jerk baits and flukes in the tackle catalogues. All of them catch fish, especially if they're used correctly. One of the more successful soft plastics on the local scene during the early to mid-2000s was Berkeley's Bass Minnow. Originally designed as a drop shot lure, it was rarely used in that role here in Australia. Instead, anglers mostly rigged this little fluke on relatively light jigs, particularly darter-style heads. To say that this lure spawned a phenomenon in Australian fishing circles would be a bit of an understatement. By 2004, severe supply shortages were being experienced as local anglers snapped up every packet of the 75 centimetre version that they could find, especially in its most popular pearl watermelon colour. Brim and bass fishers in particular were quick to recognise the effectiveness of a Berkeley bass minnow rigged on a light data head and flicked or jerked under bait schools or near structure. Although now often overlooked in favour of other plastic styles, small flukes remain just as effective today as they were back then, and larger flukes are also deadly offshore on snapper and many other species. The next category I want to look at are integrated swim baits. Despite their very close resemblance to the soft fish and shads described earlier, pre-rigged swim baits with built-in or integrated weights and hooks deserve their own category. This classification had been around for some time before the squidgy slick rig really put them on the fishing map here in Australia. Today, there's lots of options in this category. These lures mostly feature a fish or shad-shaped body, but they usually have the weight, hook and line attachment point pre-moulded into their PVC bodies, making them a single integrated unit. Their big advantage is the fact that integrated swim baits are easy to use as no assembly or rigging is required. They can be simply tied or clipped to your leader or line and you're in business. The downside is that tail damage from toothy critters can render this lure useless and because of their construction, they're relatively expensive. Integrated swim baits represent an evolutionary link between hard-bodied lures and soft plastics, and I think this is a big part of their popularity. Lots of anglers use them just like hard bodies, either trolling them behind a moving boat or casting and cranking them with a straight, slow to medium retrieve. Of course, lots of variations can also be added to these presentation strategies. Soft plastic worms are one of those lure fishing enigmas. In the US they outsell most other lure types, yet here in Australia they never really took off. Unlike an American largemouth bass, many of our Aussie fish don't have either the mouth nor the disposition to cleanly suck in a long bait like a rubber worm in one go and get hooked. Smaller worms that better match our natural prey items and better suit Australian fish have slowly carved themselves a relatively small niche for this category on the local scene but they still remain underutilised here. Mostly these plastics are fished fairly slowly and close to the bottom. Next up, let's look at prawns, shrimps and craze. Considering how popular these all are as fish food, it's hardly surprising that many soft plastic manufacturers have spent a lot of time and effort trying to imitate crustaceans such as prawns, shrimps, yabbies, crayfish and crabs. Overall, their results have been a bit mixed, ranging from downright ordinary to dazzlingly effective. One of the most impressive, I reckon, is the American-made DOA shrimp. These lures look a lot like a prawn, but far more importantly, they swim like a prawn. Prawns tend to glide steadily through the water when unmolested, then flick and dart away erratically when alarmed. That glide is a real strike attractor. Imitation yabbies and crayfish are also well represented in the ranges of many soft plastics. Crab imitations are available too, and the better ones definitely have a role on everything from brim down south to javelin fish and even permit or snub-nosed dart and golden trevally up north on the flats. 
Next, let's look at surface plastics, especially frogs and toads. Look, virtually any soft plastic lure can be rigged unweighted and fished on or very near the surface, but that doesn't necessarily qualify them as true surface plastics. When I use that term, I tend to think of hollow or floating plastics designed specifically to be fished as topwater lures. Traditional examples that spring to mind include Man's Goblin and Ghost and the Southern Lure Company's benchmark Bass Rats, Scum Frogs and Tiny Toads, to name a few. Soft versions of various poppers, fizzers, paddlers and other topwater lures are also offered by some makers, providing all the attractions of their hard-bodied alternatives, but with that added charm of a lovely soft plop when they land. To these can be added a whole raft of plastics which sink at rest, but are designed to be fished on or near the surface using a high rod angle and a steady retrieve. Soft plastic tubes or gitsets, which is the name of a particular brand, are another plastic style that's never really taken off here in Australia. As their name implies, tubes are hollow soft plastic shaped a bit like an uninflated party balloon, a water bomb, or, <laughs> let's face it, a condom. They're normally rounded and closed at the front and have shredded tentacles at the rear end. They can be rigged in a conventional manner on a jig head, with the lead head in front of the tube, but they were really designed to have the jig fitted inside, with only the hook point and the hook eye protruding from the top of the lure. Rigged this way, tubes present a soft, edible morsel with few external hard bits to deter bites. They also tend to sink fairly slowly because of their bulk, water resistance, and a propensity for some air to get trapped inside the sock part of the tube. This can be a real bonus, prolonging the hang time in a likely strike zone. Most of these tubes have little or no inbuilt action and they rely on rod manipulation and lots of pauses and drops to appeal to fish. Finally, there's what I lump together as the critter baits. These days there are some truly incredible soft plastic creations on the shelves of better stock tackle shops, not to mention spilling and crawling from from the multicolored pages of overseas mail order catalogues. Rubber spiders, snakes, centipedes, helgramites, mud eyes, rats, mice, frogs, lizards, newts, salamanders, toads, crabs, and even soft plastic chips or french fries. I kid you not, they're all available. Some even catch fish. <laughs> Critters are ideally fished on relatively light heads or even unweighted and often do their best work when simply cast as close as possible to likely fish holding structure and given a gentle shake or shimmy. They can even be suspended under a float with good results at times. The addition of some scent or feeding stimulant can be a big boost to results with these as they are with most other plastics. Various critters also make excellent trailers when they're fitted to spinnerbaits and bladed jigs or chatterbaits, but that's another story for another time. Okay, let's move on to looking at the presentation vehicles that we rig our plastics on. Considering the extensive amount of magazine space and instructional video time that's been devoted to the subject of fishing with soft plastics over the last couple of decades, it's surprising just how little attention has been paid to the delivery vehicles used to present these lures to fish. In other words, the hooks, weights, jig heads and other bits of paraphernalia that we actually rig our plastics on. Fact is, the best soft plastic tails on the market are next to useless as fish catching tools without the addition of a hook and in many instances some extra weight to allow longer casting and also to carry the lure down through the water column to the desired fishing depth. There are a number of ways of achieving these goals. Plastics can be rigged on standard hooks of exactly the same type used for bait fishing or on specially shaped, often wide gape worm hooks and then weighted with fixed or running sinkers of various styles. These sinkers or weights can be placed either above, in other words in front of, the plastic or below it, as is the case when using a paternoster or drop shot style setup. Believe it or not, soft plastics can also be suspended under floats, and although this technique hasn't been all that common in Australian waters in the past, a few more anglers are giving it a go these days, often with surprisingly good results. Of course, as already mentioned, some soft plastics are also sold pre-rigged or have integrated internal weights with built-in hooks and hook connections. These integrated plastics are a viable alternative, especially for newcomers to plastic fishing or those who only dabble in it occasionally. 
On the other hand, more serious users of softies tend to prefer the flexibility and the long-term economy of the modular system, mixing and matching their own tails, hooks and weights to suit changing conditions. All of the possible presentation alternatives, pre-rigged, unweighted, weedless, snag-proof, drop shot, Texas and Carolina rigs with fixed or running sinkers, Ned rigs, float suspended plastics and even oddball presentations such as the wacky rigs have a place in the arsenal of the complete soft plastic fisher. You can Google any of those and find lots more info on them. But I want to look in more detail here at the most common and popular of all plastic presentation vehicles for most Australian fishing conditions, the humble jig head. In relation to soft plastic fishing, a jig or jig head is simply a hook with a built-in sinker or casting weight attached to it. Within that broad definition, there's an incredible array of possibilities and permutations in terms of hook pattern and size, head shape, head weight, head density, construction material, tail keeper setup, weed or snag guard, and so on it goes. The simplest and most popular jig heads consist of a straight shanked, round bend, usually Aberdeen style hook with an unpainted or painted spherical head made of lead or a lead alloy. Traditionally, these jigs are built on purpose-made jig hooks that have a 60 to 90 degree bend in the shank near the hook eye. These hooks are placed in a mould and the molten alloy poured in to form the head around that shank and bend. This configuration places the hook eye on top of the finished round lead or alloy head on the same plane as the hook bend and hook point. There's also generally some form of holding device or keeper to help keep the plastic tail secured snug against the weight on the hook. The result is a jig that sinks and rides point up in the water, significantly reducing snagging and fouling with weed. I hate to think how many of these simple jig heads I built for myself between about 1998 and 2003 by bending the shanks of hooks, usually only to about 45 or 50 degrees to avoid snapping them, before crimping and gluing split shot to that bend that I'd made. That was painstaking work, but it was essential in those days due to the limited availability of good commercially made jigs, especially at the smaller and lighter end of the spectrum. All that DIY stuff also helped to teach me many important things about jigs and how best to make and use them. Thankfully, high quality jig heads suited to a wide range of local fishing scenarios are now readily available in this country. So I really need to craft my own heads these days, unless I'm seeking some particular set of unusual characteristics not commonly found in the factory made models, like a really big hook with an extra small weight. By changing the design features of jig heads, manufacturers can tailor them to do different jobs. For example, jigs intended to catch big, powerful, Powerful fish living in snag strewn waters call for heavy gauge, extra strong jig hooks. There'll be a price to pay for this because you'll often need a little extra force to drive such a thick hook into a fish's jaw. By contrast, if you're targeting fish that live in open water, you might choose a jig built on a very fine, light gauge hook. This hook will have the best possible penetration characteristics, especially at longer casting ranges and on lighter tackle. Although not as strong as a heavy gauge hook, on the relatively light line and drag settings that can be used in open water, this fine hook shouldn't bend or break. Keen, versatile soft plastic users will have examples of both these jig head styles in their tackle box, as well as everything else in between. Ideally, in a range of weights and hook sizes to suit all the different plastics that they use and the fish that they chase. Matching the hook size, particularly the length and gape, to the tail that you choose is mostly a matter of common sense. Hooks that are way too big or too small for a particular tail simply look wrong and they they don't work all that well. There's a degree of flexibility in all of this, although the hook size can be critical at times, but the gape of the hook needs to be wide enough to allow for easy rigging of the plastic and to provide good point exposure, but not so large as to throw the lure out of whack nor make it unnatural and unbalanced. Like I said, it's mostly common sense. Small barbs are also favoured on modern jig hooks, and the oversized ski jump style barbs of yesteryear really have little place in sophisticated soft plastic tweaking. In fact, increasing numbers of anglers are choosing to squash their barbs down and go completely barbless. While this might cost you the odd fish, especially on jumpers like barra, trout and Aussie salmon, it's also kinder to fish (laughs) and to anglers. It makes for much speedier hook removal from the fish or you, and it prolongs the life of rubber tails, which stand much less chance of being damaged as you wrestle to remove the jig head. 
from a struggling fish. Choosing the optimum weight jig head can be a slightly trickier matter than picking the right hook. Trial and error will often show you the right one to use in any given set of circumstances and you'll eventually develop an innate feel for picking the right head to suit the prevailing conditions. In many finesse situations, particularly where fish are under pressure and becoming increasingly choosy and difficult to tempt, using the lightest head practical can sometimes be a key to getting more bites. However, note my use of the word practical. It's no use going so light that you simply can't cast the lure far enough to reach the fish or get it down in front of their faces through a deep, swiftly flowing current. It can also be counterproductive to use a head so light that the tail refuses to swim on the drop while the jig's sinking. This last point is an important and often overlooked consideration and it's well worth watching how various head weights influence the swimming action of different tails as they sink on a slack or semi-slack line. Spend some time looking at it. It's fascinating. Head weights and sink rates also directly influence what I like to call hang time. In other words, the period a lure spends falling through a particular strike zone. I first really twigged to this when Barramundi and Jack anglers started complaining that many standard jig heads sank too fast for their needs. By the time they got up to the hook and head size suitable to match the tails that they preferred on those tropical species, these northern fishos found that the lure was so heavy it simply plummeted to the bottom or straight into a snag often hanging up in the process. One answer is for manufacturers to make jig heads that are less dense. These are typically made from lighter materials like aluminium or even various plastic resins, or they incorporate a small amount of lead set within a lighter resin casing. These approaches provide the bulk to match big tails and carry hefty hooks, but at a considerably lighter density to prolong those all important hang times in and around the snags or over weed beds. Nowadays you'll find a few of these offerings on the market if you search hard enough, allowing you to play around with those all-important sink rates and hang times. In fact, my son Tom has been 3D printing resin heads and offering them through his starlotackle.com website. Worth a look if you're interested in that sort of stuff. I'll put a link down below. Speaking of jig head variables, the design of any holding device, keeper or collar on a jig is quite important as well. Most jig heads come equipped with a keeper or keepers. These devices are intended to secure the soft plastic tail to the hook or jig head, preventing it twisting or sliding out of alignment. Keepers also resist the tendency for a biting fish to drag the rubber tail down into the bend of the hook. Getting pantsed, as it's colloquially called, as in having your pants pulled down, is not only annoying because it spoils the action of the lure for the rest of that retrieve, but it also dramatically reduces the life of the tail. Each time a plastic is slid back into its correct position on the jig after a pantsing, the hole made by the hook shank and keepers is enlarged until eventually the tail simply won't stay put. Then it's time to fit another tail or reach for the tube of superglue. Many jig heads feature a fairly fat lead collar, often with one or more lead spikes or ridges. These work pretty well on thicker plastics, but they can cause problems with some of the slimmer styles, splitting and tearing them. Smaller wire prongs or barbs tend to make better keepers for slimline plastics. Again, it's a matter of horses for courses. Finally, before leaving the subject of keepers, I'll give you a red-hot tip. If you're using a particularly energetic style of plastic presentation, such as whipping plastics for flathead, or getting pantsed rather too often, think about adding a small drop of superglue to the hook shank, keeper, or the back of the jig head before sliding the tail forward into its final place. Give it a try, but always use the smallest drop of glue possible, <laughs> and try to avoid sticking your fingertips together. Trust me, I've done it. Head shape's another variable you can fine-tune when looking for optimum performance from jig-rigged plastics. Beyond the basic round or ball-headed jig, which suits so many common fishing styles, there's all manner of shapes worth considering in specific applications. Some of the most popular include football, stand-up, bullet, fish head and various wedge designs, as well as heads with built-in diving or wobbling lips, weed guards, rattles and various spoon or spinner blades attached to them. Each design has its place. It's worth noting, for example, that bigger bullet heads are particularly useful for getting down fast in deeper water or strong currents. Perhaps the most useful of all designs beyond the plain ball or bullet head for common Australian fishing scenarios is the so-called darter-style jig, with its pointed nose and sometimes flattened sides and keeled underside. 
When worked with a series of short, sharp, rod-tip flicks, this head, more than any other design, jinks and darts from side to side in an erratic manner that can be a real fish turn-on in many situations. These darter heads work especially well with stick bait or fluke style plastics that have very little inbuilt action of their own. The combination of a light darter head and a soft stick, flick or fluke bait has a proven track record on tough targets such as brim, most notably in hard hit waters where these fish get to see lots of lures every year. There are definitely situations where a modification of the time-proven standard jig head rig has its place in Australian soft plastic fishing. There are also a range of quite radically different presentation strategies and vehicles for presenting plastics, all of them having at least some application to the local scene, and many of which are likely to see a lot more exposure in coming years. But I'm sure that I've given you more than enough to think about (laughs) in this two-part series of soft plastics 101. Next episode in the podcast series, we'll move on to advanced soft plastic fishing and look in detail at the major rigging options and strategies for these deadly lures. Trust me, you won't want to miss it. Meanwhile, I hope you'll check out my Starlo Gets Real channel on YouTube and also consider helping me to produce more content like this for you by buying me a coffee or shouting me a beer. To do so, simply go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Starlo. And until next time, this is Starlo wishing you tight lines. <laughs>